Welcome back to the Run Radio Podcast. My name is Trina Wilcox, and my guest today, another person giving back to the Arthritis Foundation of Missouri. They have partnered together, doing great things. I want to introduce Linda Prio with Continuum. Welcome. Thank you for having me on today. I appreciate that. So nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you. And I just learned you also have a podcast. You kind of know how this works. I and do. We'll talk about that too, which I'm excited about. But let's talk about how you actually, how Continuum started, how you partnered with the Arthritis Foundation, all that good stuff. That sounds great. Yeah. So, so I've been working um, in health for quite a few years now. And uh, we have a very um, segmented, siloed, disjointed health system. And so my job is really as a marketing professional and an educator. And I realized very quickly that um, the, nobody was talking. They weren't talking to each other, provider to provider, but what happened is now the family or the person uh, going through the process is sort of trying to figure out a lot of terminology and information that they don't really understand. And sometimes that doesn't really gel with common sense, right? Yeah. But it just didn't translate well for the families. So I've stayed in this uh, space Um because I know how important it is for families and clients and patients to find their voice and understand their role in their health care, uh, but also to try to help um, cross over uh, with educational marketing so that people feel more successful and fulfilled in their roles, like they're really helping their patients to yeah. a, to a higher level. Yeah. Um. So uh, that's sort of how I started. I came to work for Continuum in 2012, and have been here ever since. Um, because we meet a very important need for people in that. Folks, as they age, want to stay at home mm -hmm. for as long as they can. Yeah. You know, it's just the way we are. Nobody said, I want to leave my home and go someplace and live in a community. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Uh, so that's one thing. So um, what we offer to people is that option, no matter what it looks like. And so we uh, support independence at every stage, no matter where you are. And then I had the pleasure and privilege to really connect with Dolores in St. Louis. Uh, and she is the executive director of the Arthritis Foundation. And we just met and she understood what I did. And I understood what she was trying to accomplish for the people uh, in our community uh, that were underrepresented to, you know, or underserved actually um, in their um, journey with arthritis. And so we became a sponsor uh, last year in 2023 and are continuing that sponsorship in 2024. Excellent. Yeah. Well, what about younger folks? I know that you were saying, you know, a lot of times as people age, they feel that threat of losing the independence, but there are also that age group where we're diagnosed younger. And the last thing we want to do is be a burden on anybody, but sometimes we need help to be independent. Do you accommodate all age groups? Yes. Um, not pediatrics. Uh, that's a specialty, obviously, mm -hmm. but yes. Uh, young adults, um, as well as seniors. Uh, and yes, uh, I shared with you in uh, some information that I sent you that my nephew uh, suffered from JRA, was diagnosed at probably around three or four. Yeah. And then uh, incidentally, the uh, girl that he is seeing um, has also been diagnosed with JRA. Wow. And so I'm very familiar with how that looks and um, the struggles mm -hmm. as well. And then my sister-in-law really suffers from rheumatoid arthritis as well. So it's a family 
affair for the Prio family, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, being aware of that. So yes, uh, the key here is to support independence at every stage. And so we don't have a lot of young folks, which mm -hmm. I think is really great yeah. on our services, but there may come a time when that might be necessary. So yes, while we tend to work with mostly seniors, uh, obviously our services are available to uh also young adults. Excellent. So well, we just good. don't have that really in our, I haven't seen that. So I think that's an encouragement to yeah. you, uh, to anyone, to you uh, who is suffering from arthritis is that actually the trajectory is really pretty good, right? It's getting better, right? With the awareness, the resources and the support from the community, it's getting better and medication is changing. So that's great. Yes, absolutely. Let's talk about some of your services. What does it look like for someone that e either notices themselves or a caregiver sees that someone needs some help? How do they get involved with you? What, what do they need to look for? What do they need to bring to you? How does it all start? Yeah, it usually starts with just a phone call and a conversation that they're either beginning to see some changes in their loved one. Maybe uh, it's somebody advocating for themselves. Hey, I can see that I need help. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a younger person still working and they're concerned about their uh, loved one being at home alone. And so that's where we usually meet people. There's some sort of need that is presenting itself and then it starts with the conversation. And then we are uh, unique in our space in, in that we are a professional organization that practices care management, case management, really with every client, which means that we're not just looking at your diagnosis and the problem that we're trying to solve. We're really looking at this from a holistic point of view and including you very much in the center. We're not telling you what we're going going to do for you. And yeah. I think that's scary for people. They think that we're going to come in and say, hey, this is what we're doing for you. No, we want to hear the things that you're struggling with and how best we can support you independently. So, uh, so that's how it begins. It's always just question and answer. And then we go to the next level of meeting in the home, which is free. And looking at the home environment, maybe we can make some suggestions. Maybe it's just an, a technology that's yeah. helpful to you. But uh, this is what we can do, is that uh, our services are private pay. They're also available for veterans, and they are also Medicaid or state-funded, uh, you know, special uh, financial need folks. Uh, they're available that way too. And so uh, depending upon the client and what their needs are, maybe it's going to shop, shopping and bringing things home and then opening or, you know, getting those things that are harder to open yeah, uh, and getting things so that you just have to lift off the top or whatever it is. That's, we see that a lot. Mm -hmm. It's that, that twist, you know, reflex. It's so hard sometimes. Sometimes people have their laundry in the basement. The basement is not accessible at this point. So we can help with laundry, light housekeeping, put the dishes in the dishwasher out, help prepare meals or stand alongside somebody who wants to prepare their me meal, but because of the disease process is so tired afterwards that we can just clean it all up and make it look perfect yeah. again. Yeah. And really that's a lot of emotional support. People think I've got to pay for that. Well, it's the emotional support. If you are not feeling well and you're watching your world get messy, you know, dishes everywhere, laundry undone, things not taken out, trash not taken out, um, trash not taken to the curb, uh, beds not made or, or bed sheets not changed. That really pulls you down emotionally. Oh, yeah. So there's, there's a support factor that comes from that. Transportation is something that we offer our clients. Uh, we're also able to help with dressing and grooming. And so at the advanced stages, maybe somebody needs a little extra support on and off the toilet or in and out of bed or the shower. And so we can provide as much support or as little. 
And then we also recognize that sometimes uh, when you have a disease process, it can affect um, your cognitive skills. And so we are able to help folks that are suffering from um, dementia mm -hmm. or cognitive impairment or uh, disease-related cognition um, decline. And uh, we can do that in a couple of different ways. We're able to provide care in the home with cueing and reminders and one-on-one -on -one care. But we also have a beautiful adult day program. We call it the club. Yeah, And it focuses on folks that need more socialization, more stimulation, um, and they're able to get a, a warm meal, uh, be with other people just like themselves mm -hmm. who are in the same uh, situation, but to have so much stimulation and socialization that it really helps preserve and sometimes flatline the experience that we're having at home all by ourselves. Yeah. Because so, people yeah. with these chronic conditions, they tend to want to withdraw and that's the least thing that needs to be happening. You're yes. absolutely right. Yeah. Get yes. out, socialize, be with other people. And that's hard. We yeah. say that and we know that that's so important. Yeah. I was just talking about that with my sister-in-law this weekend is that we know that um, as our lives change, the groups that we're interested are going to change. Mm -hmm. But how do we jump into that, you yeah. know, socially? So important social engagement. And that's one of the reasons why people do like to go to communities and live. So I'm not, I'm not anti-community. I'm mm -hmm. just saying that there's different ways to solve this uh, progression of the disease and what do you want to do with that? And yeah. if you want to have uh, care at home, it's totally possible. Do you do overnight care? Yes. Okay. Now yes. let's talk about then the people that help you out. These, it takes a very compassionate, understanding person to help do this kind of work. What if someone is listening and thinking, man, I, I would like to serve. Do they need to be a nurse? Do they need to be certified in anything? Explain what that person needs to have in order. Yes. So uh, if somebody wants to become a caregiver, is that what you're asking? Oh yes. Uh, which is great. Just give us a call or uh, reach out to an agency in your location and make that introductory call. But no, you do not do not have to be a nurse or a certified nursing assistant. Uh, but we are finding uh, that uh, the care needs uh, have advanced. Oh, All right. Okay. So it's not just companionship care. Usually it's hands-on care. Okay. So uh, you can get experience by taking care of a family loved one. And we're also going to want to see that you have the obviously compassion is the number one. Yeah. And being safe to be in your home. If yeah. you're not safe to be in my home, we're not going to hire you. Yeah. So if, if we wouldn't allow somebody in our homes, we're not going to allow them in your home. So obviously background checks are going to be very important to us. We're one of the few agencies that drug tests. Uh, these are our employees. So you are you would be covered with liability insurance and uh, workers comp. So compassionate care, somebody who's really interested in, in helping somebody be successful and that because each client is unique, we're also matching that skill set with that client. But obviously, if somebody wants to become a caregiver, you would start off with more of a companionship, like housekeeping, transportation, shopping shift. And then we offer additional training as well in our office. So yes, it, we would love to talk to anybody who's yeah, interested in becoming sure. a care partner for for someone who needs extra help. Talk a little bit about some of the clients that you have served as far as how you've seen their lifestyle improved for having getting involved with Continuum. Yes, great question. Um, 
we actually uh, start and end clients all the time. Yeah. So at times, people only need a little support to get over the hump. And then they're back on their feet again. Yeah. So many times with arthritis, you might have a flare where you're doing really well. And then there's a dip mm -hmm. and you're just trying to figure out how this is going to look and knowing that you just need that extra support. So I would say that many, many of our clients, probably over 80% of our clients come to us when there is a need that we're trying to solve. And as they improve by getting back on track with their uh, medications or diet or exercise or therapies, and those healthcare needs diminish, mm -hmm. then they just end their services with us. Okay. And if it should happen again in the future, then we bring them on service. But we are able to help patients all the way to our clients uh, to end of life if needed. Yeah. Yeah. But no, a lot of people improve. And that's really what we're designed to do is to come alongside help you get better by putting enough interventions in place uh, to be, help you be successful. Yeah. And that's where we find our, our clients, families, or the client themselves is like, no, that's just too much care. And we're just trying to say from our experience, do you really want to readmit to the hospital or do you really want to be safe and yeah. have the best opportunity to get well? You could almost look at it as another form of medication, you know, like if you, if you need this to function better, take it. So take the help as a form of being better and being more independent and feeling, you know, better inside as well. And that's really, I think you just tapped into that something that's really hard for everyone is to say, I need help. Yeah, it really is. In my younger years, I was blessed to know several ladies who um, had MS. Mm. And of course, it's another disease that hits people so differently. You know, yeah. everybody's situation is so different, different. But that's what I noticed about them, that they were able to ask for help when they needed it. And then when they didn't need it, okay, yeah. I'm good again. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much for the help and support. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah my feet again. Yeah. Sometimes that's all it takes is a little bit of support to go a long way. Right. Let's talk about your podcast, what you talk about, where people can go to hear it. Yes. Well, after years of experience and working with families and being in this space, I understand the lack of knowledge that people have. So whether it, it at whatever stage you find yourself in a health situation, obviously we love to have lots of information, yeah. but sometimes navigating your health system is not as easy as we would like for it to be. Yeah. And uh, you may also be not only navigating it for yourself, you might be helping senior parents, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Or friends or partners or whatever. You you want to help them live their best life. And I feel like living my best life uh, includes education and knowledge. Um, if I don't know what I need to know, I can't really make a decision, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, and, but if you tell me what I need to know or help me to learn that, then I can move forward. I'm not sitting looking at the blue swirl on my computer, just going around and right, round, right, round and right. round, right? Yes. And I think sometimes uh, professional guidance is underutilized. I've mm -hmm. noticed that families think, well, I know it all. Yeah. I don't know it all. I had, My mother lived to 100 and believe me, I had to navigate that as an only child every day. Oh, and right. Oh so, my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't get the easy plan, even if you're knowledgeable. Yeah. So I, I do find so that professional guidance and help is underutilized. So my podcast is called Aging in Play Strategies and Answers. I launched last year out of a desire to get information out to people 
who might find themselves in this space. And so I offer guidance and education on a variety of different topics that you're going to experience as you plan to age in place as you plan to retire and think about what's next, how you're going to live this longevity, because I, I just told, said earlier, and you agree with me, trajectories are really good, but we know that sitting down doing nothing is not really good for us, right? Right. right. So it is full jam-packed of wonderful advice. So really sharing it with others and, um, you know, following the show is, is wonderful. I appreciate all that, but my, my higher aim is that it's really beneficial, uh, mentally, uh, emotionally and physically to the people who listen. Yeah. I'm glad you're sharing that. First of all, patient advocacy, there's not enough of it. We have to be our own advocates it's like you're saying, the conversations between the patient and the healthcare system are difficult to navigate and it's stressful. And to have someone yeah. else, you know, to be able to turn to for some answers or ideas even is so helpful. It's amazing because I think about times where I don't feel well, but I know what I have to do to bug the pharmacy, bug the doctors, all this kind of stuff. And it's hard. And for people that don't know that, and maybe they're newly diagnosed, it stresses me out for them to think that they're not knowing that they've got to push. They've got to do the calls. They've got to stand up for themselves because it won't just happen. Yes. So I'm glad that there are those resources and other people saying, you've got to advocate for yourself. You've got to get people in place to help you out. And I have a friend now who's navigating the waters of being an only child and aging parents. And it's like, I mean, it's a lot on her shoulders. We think it's going to be easy. I was a mom, I'm a mom of three adult children now. And I thought I can take care of my mom. This oh. is no problem. Take care of my mom, work, be a grandmother, be a good employee, blah, blah, blah. I think day two, I, I remember thinking, what just happened to me? Yeah. I don't know if I'm going to make it. So fortunately, I have pretty, I have established <laughs> uh, coping skills along the way. But there's all kinds of times where I had to lean on my office staff and say, what is my next step? Because my head got into a blur. I was emotionally connected. Yes. And that's what the professional advice does you're sitting in a swirl, whereas because I'm a professional and I have no emotional skin in the game, no financial gain in the game, I can, I can, I can cut through all the noise and just guide you to the next step. And, and that to me is invaluable. It right? is excellent. And, I, and I'm sorry you had to go for that, go through it, but I'm glad you're turning it around and sharing your experience. What were some of the surprising things you said by day two? What were some of the things that hit you all at once that surprised you? Well, I think uh, we don't understand as a caregiver the emotional component. Yeah. And so at the end of every podcast, I always have a caregiving tip. Okay. Because I failed, right? right? I took care of everybody above myself, right? But I think the emotional, the, the skill set was there. Yeah. The organization lining things up. So I need to get up at this time to take care of myself. I need to get my mom's pills, her food, get everything lined up for the caregiver that was coming in. I need to have what I needed to go to work, right? Yeah. And then um, the other support systems that helped me out. So it was really the emotional component of watching a loved one who yeah. is starting to fail. Yeah. And then the organizational skills that I needed 
to get on top of my life rather than to have things keep hitting me that I wasn't prepared for. Yeah, It wouldn't have made me a good employee. It wouldn't have helped me to help my loved one and then my extended family. So I think those were the key things. So I'm really committed to care partners and caregivers and knowing um, the struggle. And, yeah. and, and I don't, I think we underplay the emotional component. We feel that we can just handle it all. And it's not it's true. Not you're going to go true. down and you're going to go down hard. <laughs> And nobody yeah. wants to do that. No, no. So organization is very important. That's a key takeaway. Yes. Um, what about, let's see, I had another question if I can remember. Oh, that's, you brought up something, you know, the caregiver sometimes gets forgotten in the whole relationship of everything. You've got the doctors, the patients, the supportive family that's asking about the patient, but forgetting to ask how the caregiver is. What could you, what kind of advice could you give to people who want to be supportive, but really they don't know either, really they've not been through it, but they feel for you and would like to help, but don't know how, what would you say to them? Right. Um, sometimes caregivers have the mentality that they can do it all themselves mm -hmm. and then they push people away Mm -hmm. by not allowing people to help. It, it's a, it's an MO. It, it's really, and I see that because we hire caregivers. Yeah. And that caregiving personality is a beautiful thing. You're never going to find a more compassionate, loving, kind person than a caregiver, but they always feel they're the only ones who can do it. Yeah. So that is a problem. Uh, in every situation, uh, with, I remember talking to somebody and they said, we have 15 family members and we're all going to be there to help. The next day they called and they said, remember, we had all 15 people and they were going to be there to help. Well, only about four of us are really committed. So right. we know that the numbers diminish. All right. Yeah. So there's going to be one caregiver that wants to be there in the hands-on stuff. There might be another caregiver who wants to be there financially. I can pay the bills. I'm good yeah. at bills. I'm organized. I've got spreadsheets. Give me all of that financial decision making. And they trust. There's a trust relationship there, right? Yeah. Uh, there's some people who are really good shoppers. Yeah. And they take on that role as being the shopper. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes there's a person who wants to be the medical person. I'll take them to the doctors. I'll report back to all of you. And then sometimes they're just me. Yeah, right. And yeah. I was an only child. So I, it was on me to handle this and, and a professional care manager can be so good uh, to come alongside and help coordinate what you cannot do. And that's where I think uh, people underplay professional guidance and the role of the professional so that you can continue on you know, we don't always get to quit our jobs to take care of someone. Right, right, right. Or quit life, right. right? Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes when you do that, you've really hurt yourself. Yeah. So I think, I have, like you are mentioning now and bringing up the importance of that, the expanded role of, of what that caregiving role could look like. There's a lot of components in that. Yeah. And and I think we have to bring that up because the statistics are staggering of the number of people in caregiver roles providing unpaid caregiving in this country. Yeah. 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 And and I think you're bringing up a good point too. Great caregivers see the need to take care of someone that needs that assistance, but then they're that makes them good, but they're forgetting to do that for themselves. Yes. Yes, so, absolutely. I think I was about a week and a half in and I'm like, Hey, I'm doing pretty good, you know, yeah. but then I didn't, I started not sleeping well. Oh, yeah. And, uh, of course this wasn't the only thing that was going on in my life at the same time. Cause that's the way it goes. Right. right. Of course. So I just, like I said, I had to take a back step and say, I have to take care of myself. So I walk, I just walk. I said, nobody needs me at five 30 in the morning. I walk between five 30 and six. It's a discipline I started. It's a discipline I continue because that's all about me at that moment. Yeah. 
It's about me doing something for me. Good. And that makes you a better caregiver. Thank you for everything you're doing. Aging in Peace is your place. podcast. A Aging in Place, I'm sorry, is your podcast. <laughs> Thank you for everything you're doing for the Arthritis Foundation. Will you be at the Bone Bash? I will not be at the Bone Bash, but okay. um, we're doing the Jingle Bell Run. Yes. We did the walk in the spring, which okay. included the younger uh, folks, which was yep. so fun. And I'm telling you, the Arthritis Foundation in St. Louis knocks it out of the park. Thank so you. fun. Doesn't matter what event you're coming to. Love seeing what they put together. So ex I'm excited about the Jingle Bell Run. My grandkids and family members got a lot out of it. And Good. we just... Uh, felt like it was a really wonderful way to support our family members with arthritis and uh, to meet with families who were looking for solutions. Excellent. Good deal. Thank you so much for what you're doing. I appreciate it. Come back anytime and I will be sharing about your podcast for sure. Thanks for being on mine. You can follow along and listen to more. Link over to watch videos on all platforms from runradio.net. Thank you.